Hello everyone. In this video, we will talk about a few methods to find limits analytically. So first we're going to take a look at limits for some common functions that we'll see throughout the course. And it turns out that things actually work out pretty nicely. So I made a little table here. Uh, so if f of x lies in any of these families, so polynomial, rational, trigonometric, exponential, or logarithmic functions, then we have the very nice property of the fact that the limit as x approaches c of f of x will be f of c, just plug in c, so long as c is in the domain, right? Otherwise, it's hard to plug it in if it's not in the domain. So this is very nice. So let's see how this works with a couple of these examples. So for the polynomial one, right? So let's just say we want to plug in two. So we care about limit as x approaches two of x squared plus three x plus seven. This is just two squared plus three times two plus seven, which is four, 10, 17. Uh, the rational one is a little bit different here. So let's try plugging in two, right? So this is in the domain we just get zero over negative one, which is just zero. But of course we would have the problem of three not being in the domain, right? So if we looked at the limit as x approaches three of x minus two over x minus three, uh, you know, if we try to naively plug it in here, we get a one over zero. And in fact, this limit would not exist. Uh, there's a vertical asymptote here. And so we can't just do it by algebra nicely. Okay, so now let's look at this rational function. So we have x squared minus 9 over x minus 3, and we're looking at the limit as x approaches 3. So again, we have the issue of this is not in the domain, so we can't just plug it in. And, you know, if we had tried to plug it in naively, right, we get 0 over 0, which is something called an indeterminate form, uh, meaning that we actually can't figure out the answer just from this. So we have to do more work. And... Here, it may surprise you that this is actually six. So why? Well, it's real easy if you have the picture available to you. So the picture looks something like this. So we care about three on the x-axis and it goes through six. So this is at three uh, here. And we just have a line and it's the line x plus three, y equals x plus three, except for, of course, we have this hole right here at the point three, six. And you may wonder, okay, well, so here I can see that it's going to be six because I'm coming in and approaching this point and I don't care that it doesn't exist at that point because I care about the behavior around it. But how am I going to find this algebraically, right? Well, that's where we use the fact that x squared minus nine is x minus three times x plus three. And so we can do this factor and cancel business which basically works out nicely because of the fact that we don't care about what happens at a single point. Because we care about what's around it, we can actually just cancel these out and say, hey, they're only different at one point, and so they're gonna have the same limit at that point because their behavior everywhere else is the same. And so it's just equal to the limit as x approaches three of x plus three. This is a polynomial. We know we can just plug into polynomials, and so we just get three plus three, which is six. So let's do one more example here. So again, we look and we see, all right, one is a problem in the denominator. And if you plug into the numerator two, right, one minus six plus five is also zero. So this is again, like a zero over zero. Uh, but we can factor this, right? And this is x minus one times x minus five over x minus one. We can cancel out our x minus ones. And so we get one minus five when we plug in to just our simple linear function, which is negative four. And so here's your first exercise. So I want you to take this rational function f of x and first find the limit as x approaches two of f of x and then find the limit as x approaches three of f of x. So sometimes we will have functions where factoring isn't really an option and plugging in isn't really an option. And another method that will help us is the squeeze theorem. So here's the statement. So we have three functions all defined on some open interval uh, containing our point C where we're gonna take the limit. And in this case, we have 
f of x is less than or equal to g of x is less than or equal to h of x uh, for all points in the interval. And we note that f of x and h of x have the same limit as x approaches c. So you can think of this as like your, your bottom function and your top function, and they are going to meet roughly at c. And then g of x is your function in the middle. It's the one being squeezed, and it will then have the same limit as well, and that's our conclusion. So we want to draw a picture here to get more of a sense of what's going on. Right, so here we can see our bottom function in red, f, our top function in blue, h, and they kind of collide at this point, c, and have the same limit, l, there. And we can kind of see, right, like if we have a function that's always between them, then if they're going to meet there, the only way to squeeze through is to also have the limit L at that point. So now we have to actually figure out how to apply this in practice. Hopefully the picture makes sense, but the algebra is a little bit more complicated. Okay, so we're going to look at the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared times sine of 1 over x. So the first thing you want to think about is, can I plug in 0? Well, no, 0 is not in the domain, right? So we can't plug in. Uh, and it doesn't really make sense to do any like factor and cancel business because the, the issue, right, is the sine of 1 over x. x squared is fine at 0, but we can't divide by 0 on the inside of this sine function and you can't like factor sine or anything. There's, there's no canceling we can do, right? And so basically the two methods we've seen so far don't work. Um, but we know something nice about sine, right? So we have some natural bounds on sine. So whenever sine is defined, right, sine of 1 over x is going to be between negative 1 and 1, right? So this gives us a natural candidate for our top and bottom functions, right? So, okay, well, I don't have the right function in the middle here. I want to replace that with x squared times sine of 1 over x. Well, if you think about inequalities, right, so x squared is always non-negative and so you can just multiply it through and it's not going to change the inequalities right so you if you multiply by a negative number you'd be concerned but here it's still going to be the same direction and suddenly we have our f of x we have our h of x and the function that we started with is g of x here right and so now think about these two functions, f and g, well, those are pretty easy, right? So the limit of negative x squared as x approaches 0, well, that we can just plug in. We get 0. And same thing for h of x, right? I mean, plugging into x squared is also going to give us 0. And so we have our inequality, right? g of x is squeezed between these two guys, and they both go to 0. Therefore, the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared times sine of 1 over x must also be 0. And if you want to check on Desmos, you can see what the graph of this looks like. But essentially, right, f of x is just the downward facing parabola. Uh, h of x is facing up. And then the g of x here, function we care about, is oscillating between and it kind of looks like this where it starts to wiggle uh, with greater amplitude as you go farther out okay and so we can kind of see yes it is approaching zero as x approaches zero okay so here's our second exercise that we'll close with so i want you to find the limit as x approaches zero of g of x where g of x is sine squared x times cosine of one over x so I want you to use the squeeze theorem. I've kind of stepped it out here. And we'll first note that the issue, of course, is with cosine of 1 over x at 0. Sine squared of x seems to be OK. And so first, I want you to find natural bounds for this problem part of the function. Uh, then I want you to try to find your natural candidates for your bottom and top functions, f of x and h of x. Compute their limits and show that they're equal so that the squeeze theorem truly applies. And then finally conclude uh, by finding your limit of the middle function. Alrighty, thank you for watching.